we should get this going. Um, what we're going to do is um, pull up, show everybody's uh, updated slides, and um, give give you all an opportunity to, you know, present to us your findings, but also um, pose your questions to us as we move forward. And really, what this is is just more of an update. Um, so we can get, kind of get a sense of uh, how the research is coming along for you and what it is that you need. Um, and so I was thinking uh, we would um, perhaps start, uh, Dr. Subash, if you don't mind, I could pull up your slides. Uh, would you mind perhaps going through them? Because I know you had a whole list of questions towards the end. Um, and perhaps we can start off with you. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm hoping you're, you, you do that. Would that be okay? Okay. Okay, great. So okay. here, um, so I will share this if I do this. Can everybody see it? That's a yes, I think. Okay. Okay, so um, so this is the update, and I know, Dr. Subash, you had a whole bunch of questions towards the end. Um, would you be able to sort of just walk us through this? This is for, um, I, I know you have several different uh, uh, plots here, um, this one from Modipuram. So uh, would you like to uh, sort of walk, discuss this with us? Yeah, here, uh, actually, this is for Modipuram. And yeah. uh, here uh, there are quadrants. I think uh, in the four quadrants, I'm almost uh, that the frequency. That means the distribution is okay, except uh, for all the uh, quadrants as well as the middle. And uh, this is for the annual because we have uh, uh, considered monsoon as well as annual in the next slides. This is for annual here uh, because we have first thought of doing for monsoon season as well as the beach season. But uh, uh, it is uh, giving lot of variation among the GC selection of GCMs. That's why this is for annual. When we look into next slide, next slide. Yeah, here, this is for uh, Modipuram, for uh, uh, Karnal as well as previous one. Previous slide, I can see. Yeah, this is for multiple uh, RCP 8.5 and uh, RCP 4.5. Here you see almost except uh, uh, three, uh, two DCMs are common in uh, RCP 8.5 as well as RCP 4.5, but uh, we got uh, three different uh, uh, DCMs as far as RCP 8.5, as well as 4.5 is concerned. Okay. okay. And so your GCM seem to differ. There, you have some differences. Your, yeah, some differences. Um, yeah, a few differences uh, between RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. Now, you're planning on running through your entire integrated assessment with both RCPs, correct? So that's going yeah. straight through to economics? Yeah. Okay. And another okay. thing is when we look into 4.5, the last quarter that is hot and dry, this, this is scattering, this is, these models are scattered here and there, even though there are five GCMs are there, but it is a scattered way. And another thing is okay. in the cool, yeah, in the cool uh, uh, quadrant, cool wet quadrant, there are also these are scattered way, not this so much variability among the GCMs. And actually, right. I have presented this to uh, in our uh, internal seminar. They are talking about why you are taking this median as a concept, median for comparison. But there are so many uh, models. Then why right. you are taking the median? Right, they right. And that was in your question. questions before. And so we we so I think there's not a, a quite um, you know so so I think that's a really good point. I think really what we were looking for was effectively something more representative of the central tendency in each of the different quadrants that we have in each of the different sections, which is why initially we were thinking that we would take the median value. And I should say right now that. Um, 
we're not going to limit these assessments to just the median value. We understand that it would take more simulations. Um, but, you know, I think Dr. Subashi had also mentioned what about taking the most extreme values, so let's say S, right, or um, one um, here, I don't know if you can see my, my, my cursor, my, my mouse here, um, but taking more, some of the more extreme values to test the range of response, the more extreme GCMs. Um, and that's possible too. Really what we were looking for was a robust method that allowed us to test um, really the central tendency of each of those quadrants that we have. And Alex could provide a, a, a you know, an additional explanation on top of that too. Um, okay. The mean, I mean, part of the reason is, is that that mean can be really impacted, right, by, by those extreme outliers. And that wasn't something that we were looking to necessarily test. We were looking to represent the, um, you know, sort of the, not consensus, but that central tendency of model response in each of these different categories, right? And these categories, you know, um, uh, you know, are something that, that, that we've just been, been looking at recently. Um, and so I would not, I mean, they're not arbitrary, but, you know, there's something that, that we've, we've kind of created, right, in order to explain the distribution of GCMs a bit better. Um, and so I think that, you know, testing the mean um, I guess particularly among quadrants with a large spread could be instructive. Um, I still think that we would want to kind of represent that, that central tendency, so I think we will stick with the median. But, you know, if you have a large spread, let's say in this hot, wet quadrant here, it occurs to me, and we're open to discussion on this, so if anyone has, has another opinion on this, we can discuss this definitely. But it occurs to me that if you wanted to better represent that variability, you could run the median um, for sort of the best representation of that quadrant, but then you could also run one with just the climate crop assessment to see what, you know, how big of a difference did it make, um, yeah. you know, between those yield results. So that could be a really interesting experiment if you have time and energy and you're willing to do that. But if your quadrant is really spread out, like your hot, wet quadrant here, I would, I would almost say that it makes more sense to me to run an extreme value than the mean of all those values, which really is just representing that extreme value at that point. Do you know what I, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if you wanted to go test the median and then an extreme value for a quadrant with a large spread, um, I think that could be something really interesting to look at to see just how sensitive the results are to that. And I think yeah. that that'll probably vary by crop and region. Yeah. Um, does that does that help a little bit to answer your question? Yeah. And, okay. Uh, just so to moving, go to next yeah. next slide. Yes. Yeah. This is this Colonel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Next slide here. Actually, I'm just showing the comparison between two sites. That is Karnal and Modipura. This site is around 100 kilometer away from the the distance is only 100 kilometer and the climate is almost the same but here also there is a lot of variation, variation in the sense only two models two GCMs you see here yeah. also the spread is different this is only the climate is almost same the rainfall pattern is almost same but when we see the projections for same RCP and uh, there is a lot of difference among the GCMs. Right, right, right. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, one goes from hot, wet to hot and dry down here. Upper. Okay. Yeah. No, this is this is good to know. So you're going to be run. So you will be running then for Modipuram and for Karnal. You'll be running these GCMs, which are roughly okay. So MPI. You have a few differences amongst the GCMs. Yeah. But this yeah. is the set for each of these sites. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is the spread, the difference between this is the maximum temperature during the March and uh, the beet yield. This is the actual data. The yield is not simulated. Huh? This is the actual data we have okay. uh, obtained from our uh, experimental site. Here, when we look into this, this is a long-term experiment. Here, the UB yield is uh, 
decreasing for the last from 1992 to 2008. There is a decreasing trend, and when we compare this with the maximum temperature during April and March, this is the March, the maximum temperature is increasing. And uh, this is the relation between wheat yield as well as the March, the March and April maximum temperature. Um, okay. Yeah. This, okay. this is actual data. This is actual data, and then when yeah. you have you run your have you run your simulations just yet? I'm yeah, just yeah. curious to see how how did the simulations were you able to plot the simulations on top of yeah, the yeah. actual data? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. After running the simulations, also we got the same trend. The simulations also from both the DSAT as well as AppSim, there is a decreasing trend in B deal, and uh, the, there is a max, maximum temperature from 1980 to 2010. We found the same trend. Okay, and your maximum temperature, I'm guessing, with your wheat yields, will probably be the, yeah. one of the more limiting factors, yeah, right? Because, one of the more, most important. Right? Because uh, during the March-April period, the wheat, uh, the phenology is uh, in the final state, that is in the maturing space, that is means the grain filling stage. So, if suppose the maximum temperature is higher, the crop duration will be less and that automatically the grain size will be smaller, that the total yield will be automatically reduced. Okay. Okay, yeah. so, you know, it could be good to, to, to visualize this at some point with your yield versus your simulated yield versus your temperature change, um, your maximum temperature change too. Whenever you have those simulations available, um, it would be nice to have a self start, you know, some some small assessment, you know, agroclimatic baseline assessment to understand how the yields are varying with respect to important climate metrics, such as in this case your maximum temperature. Um, so, have you thought about, you know, perhaps regressing your wheat yield against, you know, your your temperature change between the 1980 to 2010 period? So that would be your simulated wheat yield versus your maximum temperature change over that period. Yeah, that, that also yeah. Became, yeah. Yeah, that could be yeah. yeah, that could be a good thing to, to visualize. Okay, great. And 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 so um so we have all of your GCMs here. We selected GCMs, so we'll so thank you for this. We'll enter this into our um into we're starting a, a big spreadsheet of, of all of these things. Um, so this is helpful. And I see you've separated from monsoon and annual, but for the economic analysis you're doing both monsoon and annual, or you're just doing no, annual? we've been doing only for the annual. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. Right. So, okay. But, um, and will you be doing just climate crop for the monsoon by any chance, or are you just looking at the GCMs for the monsoon? Yeah, this is uh, just for the comparison purpose. I have run the uh, projections for the monsoon season. Yes, whether okay. they are uh, uh, giving uh, a lot of radiations among the GCMs, that just uh, for uh, Study purpose. Right. I just to do it. Right, right. Okay, great. So this and, is this uh, is really useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing is for the for the location mirror, I have run for the near uh, near century, then uh, midterm as well as the end of the century. There are also lot of variation among the GCMs. Right, right. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah, I am not that. showing. I am not showing here. But there is right. lot of difference, and in right. some of the uh, some of the uh, centuries, that means midterm or uh, not midterm in the near future, near uh, near term, there is uh, the spread is uh, there is uh, only two or the three GCMs fall in the quadrants, some of the quadrants. Yeah, and that's something that you know is 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 both noted in the climate community too, right? As we move forward in time, the spread of results amongst the GCM that cloud starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think Alex has showed this in a few ways, so that's consistent with what we know. Um, but definitely, if you're planning on contrasting the near term, right now I think we're we're really just focusing on mid-century. But if you're planning on contrasting the near term with the end of century, you will get some pretty distinctive, um, different results uh, between that, um, and that's related to issues of model sensitivity and sort of how that that sort of uh, changes over time. So, 
Um, no, so I think that's a good point. Um, for now, though, I think we're just going to focus on the mid-century. But if you're planning on running the end of century, too, that, that, that would be an interesting contrast. I know you have a lot of work ahead of you, so you may yeah. not want to do all of that. But um, it's great that you actually just compiled this, because this will be really useful for us in identifying, um, at least for the monsoon region, what this looks like. Um, okay, and then lastly, I see you have a few questions here. I just have one quick question. Were you able to run the farm climate scripts for, um, for the, finer, the finer scale information for your yeah, site? We have already generated the farm uh, climate for all the okay. 76 farms for Mira district. We have done the essay earlier also. Earlier we did the same. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. So, okay, so you're pretty comfortable then, and you have all the information that you need to move on, I guess, to the crops, which is good. Um, so I'm at your, your questions here as well, too. So I think we, we, we discussed the first one. Um, yeah. We've looked at the second one, too. There, there is indeed a lot of variation, and that's something that's just known in the climate model community, right, that that spread of models is there. So we have to figure out, you know, how to best represent that. And then for your question three, I would say, yeah, I would definitely, if, if you're willing, um, I, would, I would say in addition to the median value, if you wanted to take the most far off GCM in each quadrant, um, then that could be useful just for, I mean, even if you did it for one site, just the climate crop, you know, and yeah. not going all the way to the economic, that could just be useful to you to understand sort of the, the sensitivity to that value. Um, so I don't know if that's something that you would be willing to consider, um, but I think that could be useful. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, so you have two more sites planned. So do you need weather? Do you need, need Agmera data for these sites? Yeah, I got the Agmera data already. I am okay. having. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. you're so you don't need anything else from us. Then you're just going to yeah. continue. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No. Okay. No. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Subash. So. Um, okay. So that's so that's our IGB. Um, let's see. I have here um, from the South India team, and then I also have is Mohammed on? Uh, I see Mary's on. Hi, Mary. Um, so. Mohammed had shared um, the Chihuahua climate team um, assessment, so I'll quickly just go through this, although I hope you guys can see this, although he's not on currently, um, but just to share some of his results, and I think you'll see Dr. Subash, he's, um, he's uh, found results similar to yours in just the scatter, you know, of the GCMs between various quadrants. So they have sites in Nioro, and here they're looking at June, July, August, September. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, they tend to kind of have more models. And so the model weighting is something else that, um, that we need to discuss that I think Alex had on his agenda to discuss as well, too, and how do we go about sort of incorporating that model weighting, and should we, as of this point, um, this might be a further discussion as well with the economists, um, as the economists um, were trying to figure out when we introduced the weighting scheme how that would actually be incorporated into the economic side of the analysis. So I think at some point um, it might be good to have them on to a follow-up webinar to discuss what we would do with the weighting to realize that that's there and we haven't forgotten about it, but um, that's something that we'll, we'll, we'll want to talk about incorporating as we move forward. Um, so they had shown results for Nioro, for Tamale in Ghana, um, and again, very different results and spreads on the GCM. If you kind of on the GCM um, as you toggle between these two figures, um, then they have Kutiala and Mali. Again, again, quite different. So they're really looking at very different sets of GCMs for their analysis moving forward. And finally, Navrongo. And so they've mainly focused, I think, mostly on RCP 8.5, although if Muhammad was on, I believe he also looked at RCP 4.5 too, although I'm not sure if they're going to run that all the way through the economics assessment. Um, but these are available. And here they've plotted, um, so this is something similar to what I was um, talking about, um, Dr. Subash. Um, you know, it, it would be good to have sort of the, the yield response 
um, to either rainfall or, in your case, maximum temperature. It, you know, one of the things that we'd like to try to do, um, particularly since we disseminated the metric script, and some of you have um, sort of a better capability to generate and understand and identify the climate agroclimatic variables that are most important to your yield results. Um, whatever those are, however you go about determining that over the baseline period, 1980 to 2010, once you determine those most important variables, just to get a sense of, you know, what of trying to identify the limiting factors to growth and looking and trying to then understand how they change um, under the future climate simulation, now that we're also changing slightly the variability as well. Um, you know, it would be helpful to have a plot that looks at yield change. In this case, they have the percent yield change on the left um, versus the precipitation change over the growing period. And I believe that what they're showing, although it's not written here, is um, the change in precipitation over the growing period for the 1980 to 2010 time interval. And so here, it doesn't look like too much. So they're showing both the APSIM and DSAT simulations over the course of that period. Um, and as far as in striking relationship, either way, I don't quite see one. Um, that might be something that they provide in their description to us. And I should say also that um, for for those of you, so Dr. Subash had provided it within within the slides. Um, if you had an Excel sheet that you could send us that shows us, um, I guess, your list of sites, right? So the, your farm locations, so the latitude and longitude of your farm locations. I have that for the South India team. It could be good to have that on file for all the teams if possible. Um, and then in addition to that, your selected GCMs, um, if you have that in, in an Excel file, otherwise I can just type it um, by looking at the slides as well too. Um, Anyway, but having a baseline agroclimatic analysis like this could be a, a nice product um, to provide from the climate team. And I think it could also feed really nicely into the CTWN and C3MT, C3MP type sensitivity experiments that are, that are being conducted by the teams as well too this time. And that's something that we really want to emphasize some, uh, a bit more. And I think kind of identifying the sensitivities in the baseline period could inform those efforts uh, quite a bit. And there could be some extended analyses with C3MP that we could do with those as well. Um, Alex has been working uh, quite hard on evaluating extreme climate conditions using C3MP. Um, and there are ways that we can fold in these historical sensitivities and identifying those variables and then those years um, that are the most extreme in the historical period. Um, and using our C3MP methods to visualize what those response surfaces could look like. So, um, so there's added value, I think, in doing um, an assessment like this. Um, so this is uh, Chihuahua's uh, um, selection of GCNs. And here you can see they've done RCP 8.5 along with RCP 4.5. And similar to your findings, Dr. Subash, it appears that there are some differences, right, between um, the, the simulations as well, too. I think they'll be focusing, again, mostly on RCP 8.5. Um, but for those of you that are ready, willing, and able, if you wanted to run the additional experiments, too, um, with RCP 4.5 or the most extreme values, that would be helpful. Um, and here it looks like um, they've taken the median from the 29 GCM um, and shown median uh, temperature change uh, for the RCP 8.5 conditions and the median rainfall change um, for this period. Um, and I don't know how this aligns with some of the GCMs that they've found. I guess this is going to be pretty close to that central value on the plot. Um, and I think that many of their projections were fairly robust, but I'm actually not as familiar. So, um, so this is actually a handy thing to show though. Um, and we've, I think at the end of Victoria Falls, we tried to circulate um, some maps for all the GCMs. Um, they were monthly maps um, that allowed you to compare in the baseline period um, compare across GCMs basically how they, and I think we just shared rainfall, so you can compare the rainfall across the GCMs um, for each month 
if you haven't received those, let us know. I think Alex had created them and we, we tried to distribute them towards the end of the workshop, but there were a lot of things going on. So if you haven't received them and you'd like them, please let us know. There were a lot of questions about um, selecting, you know, of the GCMs that you select, right, the five GCMs that you wind up choosing from each of the quadrants. There were a lot of questions about how well did those GCMs represent the baseline. And I think there are a lot of reasons that we have to be careful about that kind of validation assessment or study because, um, I mean, there, 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 there are quite a few reasons. One is related to the resolution. Others, you know, are, are sort of related to some of the, um, the model biases um, that are present there. Um, but that is something that we could also uh, potentially distribute um, to help you kind of make your selections. I mean, one of the things that we had mentioned was that if, you know, let's say in the monsoon region, if none of your months are showing any rainfall, June, July, August, September within the monsoon region in the baseline, but that's a GCM that you wound up selecting, perhaps we want to consider then selecting the next closest GCM to the median value instead, or just another value, um, because we don't want a completely unrepresentative model in the baseline to be included in your results. Um, that's something that we'll kind of take step by step though. And if you have concerns um, or questions or you just wanna make sure that the GCMs you're selecting are representative, um, please let us know because that's something we can we can work with you on. And we want you to be able to obviously, you know, defend this, this method um, when you present it elsewhere. Okay, I just wanna see. And I think Alex is here. Yeah, sorry, I'm Roughly. so late. Mm -hmm. right That's okay. So, um, so Dr. Subash has just finished um, presenting um, his update, um, and he brought up some really good questions about the median value versus the mean value versus the outlying values in each quadrant. Yeah. Um, we just finished um, updating. Um, this was Chiar's, uh, Chiar's slide. I didn't see Muhammad on here, but um, I just wound up walking through his slides as well, um, just so that we're exposed to that. Um, and then um, I started to discuss the weighting a little bit, but um, we haven't really incorporated that as much as we'd wanted to just yet. And there were some questions from economists about how that would kind of impact their results. So maybe you'd want to speak to that. But at this point, I only have the South India results as well yet. I was kind of, and Dr. Namorthy has sent in slides as well for that. So we can either go through that. Um, but beyond that, I don't, I think uh, uh, Agnet Pakistan um, as well will be sending in their slides in just a bit um, as well if you haven't received them already. So that's about where we're at. <laughs> Great, thanks for, for getting started on that. And again, sorry I missed it. Um, but this is, I think, quite helpful. And I'm sorry I missed Dr. Subhashan's, but um, in terms of the economics side, uh, at this point, we're not entirely sure how the weights will come into play. We just know that it's valuable information. Um, I think it will probably be nothing more than at the end when we have our kind of final table um, that shows the results from five different GCMs for each region. We will also have next to it a weight that will allow us to say, oh, you know, notice that the more extreme scenarios are more or less likely than others. Um, at the very least, that amount of information would be very valuable. If we want to get further than that, we could potentially try to make a distribution where you kind of sample certain models more often than others. That's kind of a second order thing. I'm not sure we've thought that all the way through. But at this point, what we've been able to do is add to the previous methodology just this recognition that some outcomes are more likely than others according to the GCM spread. Um, so at this point, I think all we're asking for is that you maintain that information um, or retain that information and uh, and then hopefully we can incorporate it later um, in terms of the outliers maybe maybe I should pause there did, did that answer your question on the economic side I think that gives us a pretty good summary yeah we were just kind of di discussing it a little bit mm -hmm. so okay so actually so now I see your slide up here for non um, let me use this maybe as an example. So here we have the cool wet is clearly more uh, common than the hot and dry. Um, it looks like the hot and wet is also more common than the, the cool and dry. So we seem to be, um, there's a, a little bit of a kind of upward skew here in terms of where the extremes go. Um, it's interesting to see that some of the models have very strong changes. Now I'll, I'll point out some of these. Um, yeah, make sure my notes are right. Uh, 
I want to make sure I'm remembering which model is which. Um, yeah, so for example, this very high one, number three, that's very cool and very wet. That's the GIF model, actually, from our own home institution here. And, uh, and that's the one with a, the, an ocean model that we've noticed has very strange monsoons. Um, is that fair to say, Sonali? Yeah, that, that's quite fair to say. Indeed. Yeah, so this, this is an example of something where it's really extreme and it looks like, wow, we should definitely run that. But actually, from the kind of perspective, it's not surprising that it's so extreme because this is a model that's been identified with some of these issues. So that's actually a good reason to kind of be aware of that. Now, just as an example, number two, which is straight down from there, Sonali, um, number two is the other version of the GIF model, which is slightly improved uh, in certain ways. And then there's a bunch of other models. But you'll see that they come back to Earth a little bit. They come back away from the more extreme challenges. So this was actually something as we were developing this method, one of our original ideas was, oh, we'll take the most extreme one in each quadrant, which in this case would have been like the three, the K, the one, and the L. Um, but that really is going to let, you know, lead to a little bit of a hysterical response. We're going to be kind of chasing the most extreme in, in every situation. And you could argue that that fully bounds the plausibility, but I think that's actually a disservice because, in all honesty, what we're trying to do here is provide the best possible information, not the most extreme information. Um, now, picking something uh, that's a little bit closer, in this case, Sonali probably was trying to decide between the 2 and the S for this green. Uh, scenario. So she would look at both of those monsoons. Maybe I'm getting ahead of my of, of you here, Sonali, but it looks like you chose the S because even even with the better ocean model, the, the GIF model still has a little bit of an issue with the monsoon. So yeah, and I um, should say this is um, this is from Induction Amorthia as well too. So I was looking at the Kalimbakar side of things. So um, Induction Amorthia, if you're on still, I can't actually if I mouse away from my screen, then you can feel free to chime in because these are your slides as well too. Um, so <laughs> please, if you have comments. Um, Please turn and, and actually, maybe before, sorry to cut you off there fast, but I, I'd love to turn it over to you to do the, the full slide. I was just hoping to use this as an example to show that we're, we're not always about chasing the most extreme values. And there, there are those reasons that I was talking about, that in, in many cases, the most extreme values are somewhat problematic. Um, and we're trying to give kind of the core responses in each uh, quadrant. So I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Is a uh, Sure, and, and no, I think that's a that's another really helpful comment too. Um, Dr. Namurthy, are you on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay, um, and I, I have the Kalimathor slides in here as well too, so I can do those later. So I mean, I can just uh, I can just go through your slides as well too. So if you wanted to quickly comment on these, that would be great. Uh, actually, my worry is I'm working on a crop which is in the post rainy season crop. Okay, so I don't think the rainfall play it's a major role in this because we are only a chickpea crop, which is a rabi crop. Rabi means as a post tiny season crop. So, okay, and, yeah. and so so just a quick question then. So you have um, okay, so you you've got sites in Anantapur, and then you've got sorry, I'm, I know I'm going around here. You've got sites in Namyal and then Anantapur. You're looking at the rabi crop in both. Yeah, it's a, like a it's a, the chickpea is grown in yeah. both districts, so we right. are looking at the rabi crop only because we will be doing all the analysis, but major focus will be in chickpea. Okay, uh, so will, will you be looking? So down here, I see you have all twelve months. Will you be just looking at, um, I guess, S O N D or D J F, or um, are you going to be restricting the months then to that season? Yeah, actually, I, I have done two graphs. Because it's uh, more the Karif monsoon also plays an uh, important role in the next season, post rainy season crop. So I'm looking at the right. rainfall in the June to September and also all year. I'm not worried about more of S O N D. So okay. hardly it, it will be around 100 to 150 or even mostly 200 to 100, 250. Okay. And so from climate to crop to economics and just so that, that time period that you're looking at is JJ, I guess, the monsoon. And then the winter time separately, yeah. I guess. Okay. So, um, so here were a few other um, baseline agroclimatic analyses that you submitted. Did you want to talk a bit through this? Yeah. Uh, actually, you can clearly see there's the two systems: the rainfed chickpea and the irrigated chickpea. So the first slide uh, clearly explains the rainfed chickpea, where you can see the clearly the quadrant one and three. Most of the points are. The, scattered in the quadrant one and three. That means uh, uh, like in rain for chickpea, rainfall is important role. 
uh, whenever there is a reduction in the rainfall, uh, I actually uh, plotted only crop season rainfall. I have not took uh, the whole season rainfall, only the crop period rainfall. So if okay. you see clearly, uh, the third quadrant, whenever there is a reduction in the crop season rainfall, obviously the yield is reducing. And similarly, there is an improvement in the rainfall. Uh, in the first quarter, there is a yield increase. Uh, if, if you can go to the next slide, which is the irrigated uh, one, uh, uh, th th there is not much difference. See, like uh, the spread is uniform for the entire all the four quarters. So that clearly shows in the whenever you work on rainfall, so rainfall is very important, and clearly the model clearly uh, the both models clearly depicts the yield levels in the different rainfall situations. And then, um, so in this case, of course, yeah, your rainfall is not going to have too much of a, an impact. I'm curious about, have you looked at the temperature changes at all? Uh, actually, I looked into temperature also, but uh, right now, this is only baseline. So I presented the baseline data, so there's not much difference in temperatures. So, like even the temperature, uh, because the sowing starts in October, whenever there's a delay in the sowing, then the temperature may play a role. But uh, right now, all my survey data, they're planted in uh, the same uh, October only. So there is not, not much influence on temperature around this. And, uh, do you have any idea why the delay in sowing occurs? Oh, whenever there is a rainfall delay, uh, the monsoon delay in the June, and it, it continues. And then, then uh, they will wait for the rainfall, and then they will start sowing in uh, October or September. Whenever there is a delay in rainfall uh, in October, then the sowing also will be delayed. And then the crop will be caught in the summer months, when it may choose in February and March sometime. So very rare. That's the problem. Yeah. So this is an interesting, interesting problem here because what we're, we're dealing with an irrigated system, which would make us think rainfall doesn't matter. But as you show here, it really does, because it affects the planting date, which then affects the temperature profile. Yeah. Throughout. And and that's a message I think we should make sure that the, the crop modelers understand. And we have to ask the question: How do we actually simulate that? Because the way we're doing our climate scenarios, you're not going to get much of a change in the pattern of rainfall you will get change in the intensity of rainfall. A little bit of like number of rainy days shifting here or there. But for the most part, um, you know, one question that might be very interesting to ask the crop modelers would be how much rainfall is needed to delay the planting? Um, because there may have been years in the historical period where planting was delayed um, that in the, or planting was not delayed. Let's say it was almost wet enough to delay planting, but not enough. And then we go to a future situation where rainfall increases, and maybe now it is delayed. Um, so, so rainfall could be important in these projections. And what we would, what I would want to do is talk to the crop modelers and say, how is your planting window in your simulation determined, and would changes in rainfall potentially still affect that? Yeah, actually, in the in the crop models, we are doing the same thing. Whenever there is a one in one week, if we accumulate 50 mm rainfall, then we are saying the crop to sow. So it will be uh, the mo model will catch the system because see, we are clearly mentioning in the seasonal strategy file. So whenever there is a rainfall of 50 mm in a one week, then it will start so. When there is a clear drought situation, then the automatically it will be delayed. Sometimes there is no sowing at all. Great. So so I think it would be very interesting, for example, to plot how often that occurs, how often that occurred in the historical period, and then in the various climate scenarios. Because if that's happening yeah. much more frequently, we should know about that because that seems a clear mechanism and something that we yeah. might even be able to tell, you know, that's a potential adaptation. If we can figure out how to plant even in wet conditions or if we can figure out how to predict those wet conditions to better optimize planting, that would be a good idea. Yeah. So I just have one question for, for, um, for everyone, I guess, to weigh in on, and it might be inconsequential in large form for the rest of the analysis, but I was wondering, Dr. Shimothi, I was thinking, you know, in terms of the, I know you haven't looked at temperature just yet, but um, in most of these areas, particularly for wintertime temperature, at least in, under baseline conditions, we do see trends, um, increasing trends. I'm not sure if you've noticed it in this region, but in, in some work that we're doing in Madhya Pradesh, we've really noticed it as well, too, for wintertime uh, pulses. And so I'm wondering, has have we thought about how to... Um, you know, what's our thinking on dealing with trends in the baseline period that could be also impacting yield results? Mm, uh, actually, I tried different sowing windows. Actually, I'm not presented. I tried different sowing windows. Uh, the temperature okay. effect I could see only whenever there's a delay beyond November. See, uh, it, it happens very rarely. 
go by beyond November in uh, in these areas. Uh, so they will give an irrigation, or at least they sow, uh, because this is not a purely rain-fed crop. Whenever there is a difficult situation, they will at least go for a one irrigation, and then they will start sowing. Hmm. So, 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 okay. so, so that way the temperatures affect. Uh, no, no, see, like maybe we need to see in the future climate because future climate there is a three to four degrees increase. So. Uh, unless until we look into the future climate uh, scenarios, then only we can know something whether really the temperature matters anything. Hmm. So right now in the baseline, yeah. I don't see any difference in temperatures and any effect in uh, okay. chickpea yields. That's good to know. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is there more to this presentation? No, not other than no. um, the deck that I sent out as a template. So, um, so we're we're done with the presentations, Alex, that I have, which was IGB, Chihuahua, and in South India. I don't know if you've received others, but at this point, the updates, at least the slides, are done. All right, and I see Dillis is having trouble joining. Um, let's see, Eric or Shari, are either of you on? I see Shari's name here. Maybe she's not listed, or maybe she's not connected. Um, I'd love to have somebody try to connect still in. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm looking through now to see if anybody else has sent me materials. Now, Olivia, I see you're on. I don't know if you've sent materials in, but do you want to give us an update? I think uh, Olivier may have been having trouble with his audio. He had signed off and on, so I'm not. I mean, yeah. I'll just check to see if the comments are. Oh, oh well, Olivier just sent a comment at one point saying number three is an outlier in Malawi as well. Our Olivier is, is he's there. He just can't. He just, his audio itself is connected. So Olivier, oh. I just thought that he had asked a question at some point. Would that case be a hint towards upscaling in this area? Sorry, I didn't see that before, Olivier. If you could write in a chat uh, what you mean by that question or what you were referring to, we'd be happy to answer it. And then is there anybody else? Mary, you're on. Um, Mary, do you have any comments or, or updates or questions? Oh, Mary, we see your video. Mary, I can see you, but I can't hear you. So I, I suggest you, 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 uh, you save your bandwidth in terms of the video, so you can cancel the video, but see if we can get your audio back in. So try to say it one more time. Mary, um, click the microphone button instead of the webcam button. They're right next to each other. And you can unclick the webcam button. Oh, a second there, I just said she had her thing. Uh, while she's figuring that out, uh, Olivier has, has added some more information. Um, Sonali, I missed this part of the, the presentation. Do you understand the, the question here? Well, we were talking about, um, so in terms of what Olivia is saying here, um, we were looking at GCM selections um, and looking at sites, I suppose, that were, you know, within at this point, you know, um, well, this is, okay, so this is uh, so very, 100 kilometers apart. Um, I'm trying to remember at what point that was now and now I, Olivia, if you happen to know what presentation that was, I can kind it's of right, but between those two, yeah. But from what I gather, there were two stations nearby and they had very similar GCM selections. That's probably not too surprising, uh, considering 100 kilometers is, is less than a lot of the overall grid box sizes. Um, so I, I think that's probably uh, reasonable to expect. It's also kind of the philosophy that we're taking here. We, if you remember, we're not doing this GCM selection for every farm within a given region because we assume that there's a, a fair amount of consistency from, from site to site within a region. Uh, I think he might have been mentioning upscaling, and he says, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it may not be critical, but um, I think it's worth exploring, though, too, Olivia. I mean, so he talks about um, upscaling, um, yeah. so I'm not quite sure well, what in he terms means of by upscaling, that. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll 
take a minute here. Can I share my screen? If I can find the presentation that I am working on. Um, So let's see, Shari, did you invite me to share my screen? Hello, hello, is it work now? There we go. All right, so can people see? Somebody is kind of giving verification that they can see it. No? Somebody say they can't see it or no? Yeah, here? no. I we can see it, or at least I can. But yeah, it's on the screen. All right, good. So this is a paper I'm working on that kind of talks more about this main approach. But what I wanted to show is this map here, actually, when it comes to upscaling. This is um, actually a map. Uh, I wish I could zoom in on it. Maybe I'll do it this way. Um, All right, so let's look at the top two here. So this is the GIS model on the left and the HASBE model on the right. And uh, I have a, I won't be able to show it, well, maybe I'll be able to show it all in one screen here. The same, same picture. Um, all right, so what you see here is, I've defined the quadrants with the same colors as you've seen before. So we have warm and wet being yellow, warm and dry being red, cool and dry being blue, cool and wet being green, and then this middle and gray. Um, and I've actually plotted the entire Hadley model over the entire world um, to see how it shapes out. And you'll see that there are certain patterns um, that come out of the Hadley model. So looking down kind of where Olivier is, you'll see that there's this difference between hot and dry in red and hot and wet in yellow. You'll notice that Hadley is almost never gray because it tends to be one of the warmer models. So it's almost always on the, on the warm fringe. Um, and there's still patterns in terms of, you know, their, the Hadley model's own unique uh, representation of, of uh, dynamics and uh, the basic state of the general circulation of the atmosphere. Um, on the left, you'll see the GIST model, which tends to be blue really more really often this. than anything else. Um, that's the, uh, that's, generally cool, but you'll also see a lot of grays in there. And even in some places like Africa and South America, you get some reds. Um, but this, this type of thing actually can be used for upscaling, because what we're doing now is we're realizing that any model falls into any, to a specific quadrant for every part of the world. So if we wanted to take all of the results from across Africa, um, we could, for example, take the hot and wet and cool and dry and, and warm and wet and warm and dry in middle results and then look at any given GCM and say, okay, in this part of the continent, which one is it? And we'll draw from that result. So in this case, we would go to Chihuahua and say, okay, we have, uh, we need to take the uh, hot and dry and maybe the hot and dry from, from Ghana, but the, the hot and wet from Kutiala, you know, in Mali. Something like that, maybe we'd be able to reconstruct the, the spatial patterns as we go from here. And we could do this for any model. And, and of course, we're making assumptions here because anytime we subset GCMs, we're making assumptions. But we would be able to, for example, um, you know, represent any given model uh, via the, uh, the sample GCMs that we've drawn from each quadrant. So it's not a perfect thing, but it does give us an idea of the general characteristic of a, of a given model. I'm not even sure that directly answered Olivia's question, but at least it's interesting. Um, now, Olivia, if you have further comments or questions, you can certainly chat, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, did we figure out how to get Mary? Um, hello, hello, any chance it works? Oh, Olivia, I can hear you. Oh, is it? <laughs> Splendid. <laughs> um, 
where was that? Man, I lost all my comments now because I have to reconnect. Oh, that's all right. Maybe you can just tell us for a minute how how are things going in in your region? Are you? I know you just had a shift uh, working with Will Trude about you know some of the the sites and the potential to kind of do not quite yes. a little bit of upscale kind of. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't send um, the updates as everybody else said. Yeah, I was a bit in a rush now. Uh, the major change here for climate is um, so after discussing with John and Tol, but we're going to meet further this uh, Thursday and Friday with the rest of the team. Is we're going to focus a bit more on the free state and commercial uh, commercial farming, and um, with emphasis on actually trying to brainstorm and find an approach to upscale climate to the Free State, which is a province in South Africa, um, where there is very good data for commercial farming. And so we discussed a bit with uh, UN Sonali the climate data as well that we could use from a previous um, hydrological study made in, in South Africa. Um, it comes with pros and cons, but um, the idea is to try to develop something and, and, and go forward with that. Good. So, um, so my recollection of that conversation is that you had some good source data that you were going to potentially fill in gaps with Agmara if needed, um, but that you would end up with this network of sites. And now the question becomes, how do we select GCMs for that? And my my suggestion is that because you're interested in upscaling, you do need to have the same GCM for various uh, parts of your upscaling. It probably makes more sense to have one GCM, you know, or you know, in the end, five GCMs, but not have a different set of five GCMs for each of your sub-regions. Yes, okay. yes, I uh, agree. Um, it's big. It's not so big that you should have tremendous differences. Um, no, it's not so big. It's in. Um, so I, I would suggest that you, the, the, the easiest thing to do would be to pick one spot and say, this is how I'm going to choose from this one spot. Another thing to do maybe is take, you know, the northeast, southwest kind of corners. The corners. See mm -hmm. how different they are. You know, take the four corners and the center, maybe, of your of your free state, and see how different they are. And maybe there is one model that falls kind of near the center of the quadrant for all sites, even if it's not the number one choice for all sites. Maybe that becomes the number one choice for all the sites. If you follow. Um, so yeah, I would just. So one thing that may, that. might be to consider in this area is actually so free state on the east side is the Drakensberg, the highest mountain in South Africa. Yeah. So there might be um, a shift uh, somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two things, about, two things about that, Olivier. So first, a lot of the GCMs don't know that they're not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. And, and then the other thing is, you know, our focus is on the agricultural land. And you know better than I how much the agricultural land goes up the slope of the mountain. But yeah. the top of the mountain is not as interesting to us as the valleys nearby. Yeah. yeah. But I'll keep you updated on how it goes in. Um, you know. Okay. Good. So the main thing we're looking for is that you you address the issues kind of with the scope of the project in mind, and then just have a justification. Yes. Anything that's different than what we're doing here, we've already discussed it a bit. Just write it up, um, justifying how you made your selection, and uh, I think we can go from there. Okay. Yep. Um, do you want me to come on a bit on? Um, Maybe to to in parallel to what the other presented, but I didn't. Oh. Just a few notes that uh, things like the the GCM3 is a outlier in Malawi as well. Oh. Um, there is no monsoon in Malawi, but it's very much an outlier. Um, there, the challenges are the same as others that they all revealed already. Different RCPs, time periods, so um, different sets of five GCMs, and through discussions with them. Um, Stakeholders and crop experts as well. It 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 is it shows that it's very interesting. They're very interested in looking often in um, risk-oriented um, um, GCM. So which one is the driest? Which one is the hottest? Which one is the coolest? Yeah. Yes, more than not necessarily the the average or medium in in quarter. In, in quarter. Um, and one, just one question I wanted to ask you guys is, um, so we've talked a lot about uh, studying uh, climate variability within that phase. And I wanted to know if there was a specific direction in that way or not necessarily yet, or if it's free and we'll see uh, what comes out. 
Yeah, so um, so two things. On the extremes, I think that's an interesting challenge because um, it's hard to determine the difference between things like you're saying, this model number three being ex like an extreme outlier in Malawi. Um, you know, we, we have to balance the kind of request from the from the uh, stakeholders for the extreme results with our own understanding of what might be realistic or not. Um, and it's, it's a tough question, and, and I'm happy to, to hear different opinions on this. I, I mean, my own personal thought is that we say, okay, we, we have gone out of our way to make sure we have the kind of representative hot, wet, cool, dry, you know, those four extremes. And then what we could do is we could show them this plot and say, you know, the one we've selected here, uh, you know, if it's in the hot and dry direction and it's causing, you know, 15% yield decrease, and then you can see that there's another model out there that's even further, you could say that, you know, there is a plausible reason to believe that there could be even more dramatic shifts. Um, and this becomes part of the conversation. You know, it's, it's the reason that we would include this full scatter plot in the final write-ups, not just the five GCMs, is so that we could say that, you know, it's kind of like what we did in phase one. The five GCMs we selected, how well do they do representing the entire spread is a topic that I think the stakeholders want to hear about. And especially if it's in a direction where there seems to be strong sensitivity. Now the other thing, and I see a question a little bit from, from Mary, which might be related to this, is that this phase we're doing a much better job with sensitivity tests. And those sensitivity tests will go beyond the subset GCMs that we have. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example the Ames, Iowa, uh, The Ames, Iowa plot, which I have here, um, you can see goes out almost to five degrees Celsius um, in terms of warming, and it goes up to 25% or 20% increase, and 75, you know, 75% of the baseline, so 25% plus or minus. The sensitivity tests that people are doing are going out at least to six, if not eight degrees Celsius, and plus or minus 50% rainfall. So we would have an idea by looking at those response surfaces and the response curves how those more extremes would react, even if we don't do the full economic analysis on them. Um, now, in terms of the baseline yields that Mary is after, I know, Mary, your team has also done a little bit of a shift in terms of how they're going to focus. Um, I think, I don't know when the last time you talked with Levin was about the project, um, but some of the original sites that they're, they're dealing with are now increasingly part of a network that they're actually going to focus on within Kenya, uh, trying to look at a, a broader uh, economic survey of the maize growing regions within Kenya. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to have a conversation, probably me, you, and Levin, and Sonali, and, and a couple others, uh, maybe Sridhar or somebody like that, to, to see exactly how we're going to do that. Because it's likely that instead of having one site with a bunch of kind of farm climates around it, uh, we might end up picking six or seven sites across Kenya to represent uh, the broader farm surveys. And the selection of those sites, we, we really need your input on in terms of which ones are the right ones to represent which regions based on climatologies and data quality and those types of things. And then we'll pick from there. And I think we'll run into the same issue that I was just talking about with, Le with uh, Olivier in the sense that we do in Kenya need to have a broader area with consistent GCMs because of this interest in upscaling. Um, so we're going to have to come up with a way of looking maybe at uh, four or five sites GCM, you know, subsetting uh, with with that kind of approach. So I would encourage you to talk to Levin, but also think about if we, you know, as soon as possible getting that map of where the maize growing sites are, uh, or even I'm sure you could talk to, to your own data people and figure out where the maize growing regions are in Kenya and try to come up with somewhere between five and 10 sites uh, that represent those regions and start thinking about the data there because those are likely where we're gonna keep going in phase two. Now the sensitivity tests themselves, uh, maybe to follow up your question also, that is something that the crop people should be doing. Um, and I, I would hope that they would share the results with you uh, in terms of being able to have the conversations like we just had with Dr. Sheena Murphy in terms of how planting data is affected by climate um, and sowing windows and all those things. So I, again, this, this could be part of that conversation with Levin about how exactly that will happen. And I know Levin really only finalized the new work plan in the last week or so, so don't, don't worry if he hasn't uh, contacted you yet. But I would reach out and just say, 
after this webinar, you talked with Alex and Sonali, and they suggested you uh, touch base about the, the kind of future plans. And then if we need to set up a, a webinar, uh, we'll make sure we have it, and we'll figure out the audio so that you can participate, too, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. And if I might just jump in, and like Alex, you've said everything that I'm about to say, so I'll just say it again really fast, but directed more towards um, Olivier's comment about what the stakeholders want to see. Given that we're emphasizing the sensitivity testing component, you know, through the linear factor analysis and then also with C3MP, I wonder if there's a way to build into our stakeholder uh, workshops, our stakeholder interactions, the utility of sensitivity testing as opposed to, I, I, yeah, as opposed to just looking at those extreme global climate models, right? Because Alex made a really important point about how model, some extreme values are just going to not be representative of the local climate processes. So it's probably, you know, better in that case to try to convey to the stakeholders that what they're really asking about effectively is sensitivity when they're trying to look at these extreme values in some ways, um, and that some of our most sensitivity testing might be better for them to assess what the impacts potentially could be. And if they want to see added levels of, like added value to those sensitivity experiments, that might be a better room to collaborate with stakeholders and form new plans for sensitivity testing than to try to identify just the extreme GCMs. And so this is just a comment and I'm wondering sitting here, you know, just how we can build, how we can kind of play up that component and really sell it not just to the fact that we need model improvement, but also make that a stakeholder, a point of stakeholder engagement in a way that the future scenarios just can't be in some respects. Um, so I don't know, that's just a thought on my end, but you know, if there's, if there's a way or if anybody wants to test run that with their stakeholder interactions in the next few months, um, that could be a really interesting interesting, undeveloped, in my opinion, um, point of, uh, you know, uh, added value to AGMIF, um, you know, in, in, these, in this round of, of the regional integrated assessment. So that's my final comment. Now, one other thing maybe to, to address something else Olivia brought up. The, uh, the variability is an interesting challenge because we have to be very clear about how these scenarios are changing the future. Um, they are adjusting the number of rainy days, they are adjusting the standard deviation of within season temperature, and they are changing the seasonal uh, values, you know, the monthly values of temperature and rainfall by adjusting the mean, um, which can have some effect on seasonality, but what it's not going to do is it's not going to introduce more El Nino events. It's not going to introduce different Madden Julian oscillations or different kind of, uh, you know, sporadic extreme events. Uh, too dramatically, especially on a seasonal level. Um, so that information, you can't analyze these scenarios and say, oh, it looks like in the future there are no more El Ninos, because that information had no ability to get in there. Um, the reason we haven't been able to do that is that there really is very little information about that. Um, there's no GCM consensus on whether El Ninos are becoming more extreme or less extreme, or more frequent or less frequent. Um, there's some theory out there, but it's, it's at this point we've kind of steered clear of that. That does not mean, however, that we don't have the ability to, ad to address the ideas of, var of variability. So we can, first of all, look in the historical period at whether our crop models are actually picking up the types of extreme events that we think should be picked up, um, that you know the observations are revealing are actually uh, mattering for the, the local production. So we do want to go through and see if, if, you know, there is a big El Nino year that we know affected the free state in South Africa that we look and see if our crop models also have the same yield impact that, that was observed. Um, and if not, we need to talk to the crop modelers about why or why not that didn't happen. Um, and Can I add a bit in there? Oh. Sorry? Can I just uh, add a few yeah. comments on what Sonali and you just said? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually linked a bit. Uh, I'd like to concur with what Sonadi said in the engagement with stakeholder. Um, the problem is that we face, though, is, is, is the scale in the sense that the stakeholder, depending on the area, for example, they're going to be interested in different variables. Uh, if they've got enough rain, they're going to be interested in the temperature threshold. And if they don't have enough 
if they don't have enough red, the, the rainfall threshold, things like that. So there might be a consistency issue there at looking at which extreme is useful for, for the stakeholders. Uh, but it links somehow with uh, what you were saying about variability. For example, with the CLIP team in Zimbabwe, we're trying to develop a, a, a parameter that is not looking at the climate, the rain and temperature directly, but for example, their, um, their traditional rules to sow, which is having um, uh, such an amount of rainfall within um, a few days and then no, um, no dry period of more than 10 days in the next month, so things like this. And actually coming with um, coming distribution over the time period, baseline, near future, and, and future, and things like this, and the different GCNs as well, and to see how a distribution in the baseline is actually changing in the future and hopefully the next step is to see how this change in distribution is actually impacting the crop distribution in these different time periods. Yeah, that, that sounds great to me. And, and this is something that we've been hoping for for a long time, which is as we start to identify these sowing rules, that's really where we need to be focusing a lot of our analyses. These are the types of metrics, you know, when we don't have those conversations with the crop modelers, we end up just doing things like precipitation correlations or maybe threshold-based uh, kind of precipitation connections, like you're saying, you know, if rainfall is above a threshold, we have a temperature sensitivity and below. But if we actually have these rules, um, I highly encourage uh, each of you to make the type of plot that Olivier was just showing, which is how do these uh, occurrences shift across these various scenarios? Um, because that's going to affect the actual outcomes and planting actions in the field. Um, the other one is, of course, those bio biophysical thresholds, if we can identify those. Um, and oftentimes the farmers know those. The farmers, you know, are worried about a certain type of event happening during the year that's related to climate and, and adjusts or affects one of those thresholds. So I think, yeah, anytime you learn about that kind of thing, definitely talk about that. And you will also get, um, even with the same variance or the same variability that you have in your, uh, in your weather data, when you warm the system or when you adjust the, the mean rainfall, you can actually get more variable uh, uh, crop yield. And that's because those threshold, thresholds are more easily uh, uh, exceeded and, and all those types of things can happen. So, um, so yeah, if, if you can identify those or if you can start to say why the variance has increased in those future scenarios, these are all conversations that are best had between the, the climate and the crop folks or between the climate and the PI who's following all these things. And that's where a really a lot of the added value comes in because then you can start to think about uh, cultivar shifts that would get away from those thresholds. You can start to think about uh, interventions or shading programs or changing planting dates and all that stuff. All right. Any other questions. I know it's quite late in the day for many of you. Um, anybody who hasn't said anything yet has been waiting for a chance. I see Agmet uh, Pakistan. Burhan, are you are you on? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Um, I don't know if I got slides from you, but uh, maybe I, I should check again. Or if you just uh, want to send uh, it. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't send the slide. Basically, the email didn't receive uh, at my email. Uh, I think it, I'm not included in the email list. So one of my friends from Faisalabad, he like forwarded me forwarded me your email. So oh, okay. I didn't know there was email. Uh, there was a presentation to be made. So, but anyways, I have uh, like uh, I can update you with the current work that I'm doing right now. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, it started from five sites. We are doing five sites uh, uh, here in the southern Punjab of Pakistan. So like uh, out of these five sites, there are like uh, four of the sites that we had data on, the historical data. So like uh, one of the sites that did not have the data, so one of the sites that did not have the data, I like downloaded the data from uh, the uh, Agmera and then like I extracted the data for that site and uh, instead used that data in place of the observed data set. So that was one site and all the remaining four sites they had their original data set. So after that I made uh, 
like different uh, uh, T, um, TNP tests like that, the same figures that you uh, like showed earlier. Those sites I uh, in those uh, figures came across uh, different uh, GCMs as per uh, according to their uh, wetness or dryness or hard and wet. So came up with a few uh, GCMs uh, like five GCMs for each site. Came up with a chart that I have right with me right now, but uh, I think I will reorganize that chart and then share it with you. Uh, let me just interject for a second. I'm going to put in in the chat box right now another email for me. Uh, my NAS email sometimes um, gets has size limitations, so if you want to send something to me and, and the NAS email doesn't work, you can try this Gmail address as well. So, um, so that's good to hear that you've done that and you've and you've picked the GCMs. Have you tried to make the farm climate uh, the the series for each of the farms or done the future scenarios yet? Yeah, basically, uh, I have run the farm climate uh, from one of the sites, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, um, before that, uh, our team from Faisalabad they went to different locations. Uh, inside the like uh, uh, where the station observatory is uh, nearest to that they took latitudes and longitudes exact latitude and longitude for those sites and using those latitudes and longitudes uh, we have run uh, different uh, like uh, farm climate for that but at the end when I asked uh, my uh, team from uh, uh, crop modeling team they like recommended that if we do the analysis for each of these sites, because we are already having five sites, and uh, in addition to that, if we do like uh, the analysis for like uh, in, like each of the farm, uh, if that farm is in also included, then it will like uh, uh, um, like uh, burden the work so much, and there will be so many sites to be um, like uh, included in the analysis. So in that. Case we only took like uh, currently for the analysis we took five sites and uh, I ran uh, for both RCP 4.5 and RC 8. Point, RCP 8.5 both of them I ran the I ran the climate scenarios for that and I have sent those files to my crop modeling team and my crop modeling team has started uh, developing the uh, sensitivity test for one of the sites that is Multan. And uh, uh, the Multan uh, sensitivity has been um, just uh, like a uh, bit of analyzed uh, till now. And it has uh, like uh, given us some results in case of like uh, the yields versus the CO2 sensitivity, yield versus the uh, as compared to the uh, nitrogen sensitivity, the Tmax team in sensitivity, rainfall sensitivity, and the fertilizer sensitivity. Good. Um, well, that sounds very, very good. I just had one question about your selection of sites. So are you saying that in all of Pakistan there are five sites that you've run, or, or there are uh, at one of your locations there's five farms that you've run? No. These are individual five sites. The farms, uh, uh, like uh, representing each of these farms, representing they are 20 in number. Each site is being represented by 20 farms. Uh -huh. So all together they make like 105 uh, five to 100 and something. Yeah. 100, 100 approximately. Yeah. So all together so, they make 100 sites. So have you done farm climate for all 100, and and is that where they objected? Farm climate is done. But the analysis, like uh, in case of like, uh, like uh, as I told you earlier, it is just uh, like uh, we, uh, um, um, the crop modeling team, they recommended that mm, all 100 sites, like it's, it would be difficult for them to analyze all 100 sites because all this data that we are modeling here, we are developing here, it has to be uh, also analyzed by crop modelers and they yeah. will add input to their models. Okay, so, I understand. Yes. So what I would suggest, Farhan, is that you use the, the central location that you that you made the weather data for, 
not the farm climate results, but the central location that you use to, to make farm climate. That is where you're going to do the bulk of your climate analysis. All right. So from that location, you will do like the GCM subset analysis. You will look at the, the yields that they are producing um, and you will try to analyze that. Um, yeah, I don't, I agree, I agree. You don't need to do sensitivity tests and you don't need to do full variability analysis and sensibility analysis for every one of those 100 farms. But I would mm -hmm. say at those five farms, you do some analyses, but then make sure in the end, when they run their full economic, you know, results and all that, they, they will use the farm climate uh, and the scenarios at each of those farms. Um, but we've always, we've always said that those original five locations, that were kind of the seed of all of the of the other climate. That's where you're going to do the the uh, the further climate analysis. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Other than that, like um, um, there were a few like while I was running uh, mean and variability uh, scenarios, like uh, there were a few uh, steps uh, while I was running that. There were a few steps in which uh, it skipped the uh, variability. Um, uh, incorporation and it like only said that only the mean change is implied. So well, I think that, that. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. So uh, like in that case, I thought that maybe in those particular months or in those particular years, the uh, variability is not that much significant, so it has skipped those variabilities and thus just intacted the mean change into that. The GCM output. Yeah, so my, my understanding of how that works, my recollection, since I, I helped write it, <laughs> so I have to remember, but my, my recollection is that in certain months when there isn't en enough uh, information in the baseline period to, to have a strong uh, distribution that's fit, if, if you have a situation like that and the number of rainy days changes dramatically, it becomes impossible to fit a distribution and therefore you don't get the variability shift in the rainfall. So in that situation, it actually is a good thing because what it's doing is it's saying, you know, let's not force a statistical distribution when there isn't enough robustness. So in that situation, we'll just take the mean change. The only the thing, thing is that, you know, especially it happened in that case where there was like less variability, a lot of zeros in the rainfall. Exactly, when yeah. When kind of the thing happens, then there is less rain, this kind of thing occurs. Yeah, so that's, that's probably going to happen in your dry season. And yes. uh, and it's worth – the reason it gives you that warning is so that you know that this has happened. And if if there is a big – you know, if you later in your paper are saying that there is a big shift in variability during those months, you now have warning that actually the scenarios don't include that variability shift in those months because the statistical approach, you know, was not robust enough in months that were so dry. So it's a, it's a warning to you just to make sure you don't over-interpret results. But in terms of methodologically, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to recognize that there isn't enough for statistical approach uh, in that dry season. So it takes a simpler approach um, in that situation. Okay. Other than that, I used uh, like um, um, in developing uh, the baseline uh, for like not the baseline, like the observed data sets. Um, I used uh, the solar radiation parameter from Agmera mm -hmm. and uh, vapor uh, vapor pressure humidity from Agmera and uh, I took the uh, T max T min and rainfall as observed data sets from the station based. Okay. Is it correct? Yeah, that's that's a good way of doing it. Now, what you you will end up with is a slightly different relative humidity because your temperature is different. Um, so. You know, there, there are a couple ways of doing that. I, I think the best way is doing what you said. You have your vapor pressure and you have the new temperature, so you can calculate a new relative humidity um, using clausius clapeyron type equations. I don't know if you're comfortable with those, um, but I'm sure at PMD somebody could help with that. And, uh, and the one thing to make sure is that you don't end up super saturated or, or something like that where you have humidity over 100%. Um, but for the most part, yes, that's the right way to do it. Um, and, and go from that. I, I was asking because how much these values uh, uh, like contribute to the output of crop model because That's, like three yeah. variables like T max, T min and rainfall these three variables are most of the time these are available 
but the solar radiation, uh, vapor pressure, humidity, and uh, uh, the remaining because uh, there are seven variables all uh, in the AgMIP dot dot AgMIP file. Yeah. So how much they contribute in the like uh, crop uh, output, crop model output? So without a doubt, temperature, maximum, minimum, uh, rainfall, and solar radiation all matter. How much they matter, of course, your crop modelers can tell you more about. It might be that your region is very solar radiation limited or maybe very rainfall limited. All those things can, can vary from place to place. You should ask your crop modelers if they even are incorporating the other variables. Wind speed, uh, humidity, a lot of the people who are running DSAT, especially is the one I know most, don't even use those variables. So if, if they're not even using them, then don't worry too much about it. I think probably do what you've already done because it's good to have the, the numbers there. But there's a chance that they have no impact on the final crop model results. I would ask them. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, okay. So anything, uh, Alex, uh, you want to like uh, um, recommend me or anything else that uh, I must include in my analysis? Because well, now I'm going to start the analysis. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is, to, you know, we, we laid out a bunch of analyses in terms of trying to get some baseline crop yields to look at, um, you know, what types of variability is, is mattering for crops. Try to figure out, you know, what are the two or three worst years uh, and do the crop models produce those and what was the climate cause for those. So, for example, you, you know, in Pakistan recently there were some horrible floods. The crop models won't be able to handle that because floods are a kind of larger basin scale activity. And that's okay. Um, we just have to be aware of that. So I think if you start to do analysis and say these are the types of events, you know, the major droughts, the heat waves, the cool spells that we think have a big matter uh, or have a big influence on yields and we're reproducing them well or not, that's a uh, that's something you can analyze. The other thing is kind of as Olivier and Dr. Sheena Murphy were saying, see if you can figure out the planting windows and start to graph what's happening with planting windows uh, or other key climate events that the crop modeling people might be able to recognize. I mean, other than that, I think producing the, the distributions and looking at your GCM scenarios at your five sites um, and trying to understand what exactly is happening, maybe make kind of monthly values uh, so you can see in, in, in the hot and dry scenario, is it hot and dry the whole year or is it just hot and dry during the key growing period? I don't know. That type of analysis you can do. And, and of course, you can always make little PowerPoint presentations with uh, with your various figures and send them my way, I'd be happy to look at them. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now we're near the top of the hour here. I, I think Sonali has to give a lecture at 10 o'clock, so she had to run. Uh, she has to teach in five minutes. Um, but anybody else who wanted to say something or wanted to, to uh, get a last question or, or comment in? All right, hearing nothing, thanks again for all of you staying up late. Um, and uh, we'll try to, to stay in touch. We'll probably try to do another climate webinar like this in a month or two. Um, but if you're interested in talking with us, you can always get in touch. Our main interest is to make sure that people don't forget about this work and are producing the climate data um, early enough that if there's an issue or a problem, we have time to fix it. So uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.